quick bio, I'm currently a PhD student in the Department of Geography, which was the originator of the term of cultural landscapes, actually, back in the early 20s. Um, I'm also the market developer with an aggregation distribution company called Farmlink Hawaii that connects small growers and commercial buyers through an online marketplace and back-end logistics. I'm also the chair of the Sierra Club for the Oahu Group, our executive committee, and some previous projects, one of which Permablitz Hawaii, which is a reciprocal gardening Ponzi scheme that I'll share a little bit more about later, and then the Greenhouse, which is a great environmental organization based in Paoa Valley. Um, so I'm here today to talk about permaculture. Um, permaculture is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, it originated as a concept coming out of Australia in the 1970s, a couple of uh, enterprising academics, one Bill Mollison and the other David Holmgren, both sort of referenced here. We're starting to look at how agricultural systems um, tended to have a lot of negative impacts on the world. Right? This was a time of serious uh, growing concern over ecosystem services, ecosystem function, and how man was supposed to continue to get by in the, on the earth. And so permaculture originated by them looking at, or coming out of study of natural ecosystems and looking at how they function and trying to explore how we could have agricultural ecosystems copy some of those functions to reduce the management, to reduce the input requirements, um, and essentially reduce conceivably the labor required to still have a productive output from an ecosystem. So in short, nobody f weeds, waters, or fertilizes a forest, for example, right? But they're still productive ecosystems. So how can we start looking and copying some of those things into agriculture? Shortly thereafter, they and so the, the permaculture originated as a portmanteau of permanent and agriculture. But as they started thinking about this and feeling very transformative, uh, it became readily apparent that you can't talk about food without talking about water, without talking about land, without talking about uh, community exchange systems, without talking about housing, without talking about energy. And so this concept very much blossomed into a whole suite of tools and approaches and so forth that were really culled from around the world from different practices, different um, groups of people, uh, and, and com sort of compiled into this toolbox, if you will, of permaculture design um, that was also sort of underpinned in the one the way that it's, it's, I feel like it's differentiated by other sort of design approaches is that there is an ethical um, foundation. Um, there are eth sort of core ethics and principles um, for permaculture. It's the ethic of care of the earth, care for people, and the redistribution of resources towards those ends. Um, so really it's not to say that a tool or an approach that would be used by a permaculture designer wouldn't be something that could be used elsewhere, but if it's employed in a manner that's extractive, that's you know, causing toxic outflows and so forth, then that's not really fitting within the, the, the lens and the work of permaculture design. So in that way, it's very intentional about how it disperses benefits to the world around us, the people around us, and ourselves. Um, so, it's a very long way of saying. Essentially, it's sort of designed for sustainable human habitats. I sort of would cast that as being separate from settlements, right? Because this is about embedding ourselves back into landscapes, having a, a more acute and persistent awareness about where and when we are on the earth and what our actions, uh, what ramifications, what out, um, outflows from our lifestyles um, there are. And so people apply permaculture from sort of lifestyle decisions into livelihoods as designers, as practitioners, as teachers and educators. Um, and really this is underpinned that the only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children, right? So it's this radical um, ownership of the impact that we have on the planet. Um, often this gets usually portrayed and mostly as fancy gardening tricks. Um, when I'm teaching, or when I've taught many, many permaculture design courses in the past, usually the first day is a show of hands of who's here to learn fancy gardening tricks. And most everyone's, you know, doing this. Um, and we do cover a lot of that. Um, today, it's with 20 minutes to go. We're, I'm not going to delve into that so much, but really just trying to think about how we're going to try, how we can start shifting how we think about things um, to go growing from spaces to places, right? So we're, we're trying to tell stories. We want to tell the story of the natural history of your landscape as well as the human history of your landscape and try and bring those together with both your um, particular sort of page in that book 
um, of how you manage that landscape and what your design and the changes that you make to it can tell about what's important in our time. I'm not going to read that out loud. All right. It's in your book. Uh, so why permaculture? There also used to be, when I first got into this, there was a, lot, a big sort of preamble about how the sky was falling. I think at this point, uh, that's probably unnecessary. Everyone's to some degree familiar that there are a few things wrong in the world. Don't need to focus on that too much. But in short, ecological de degradation, social injustice, and economic inequality, which another way of thinking about it is there's only one Earth. We all have to live on it. Why not make it great for everybody? Um, and Rosemary Morrow, who's another uh, Australian permaculture designer and educator, essentially does a great job here just summing up that the issues of climate change, land degradation, and decreasing biodiversity are everyone's problems with local and global impact. So what does this look like in practice? Very succinctly, um, and borrowing from a, a book called Practical Permaculture is just a, a, you know, a very data information intensive design process, right? So we're starting with topography, photography, you know, all manner of information about land use, soils, and so forth. And this is, you know, somewhat similar to most every other design that involves land or buildings and so forth, right? So every sort of field has its own track. Um, and these guys have done a great job, Jesse Bloom and Dave Bolney, of actually kind of laying out what that looks like. Um, as well as making sure that there's a, there's a fair amount of work that goes into sort of assessing the client needs and what they're interested in, in terms of their vision, their mission, what resources are available, and then you're able to start piecing together a particular design. So it can be very information intensive, but it's also imagination intensive, right? So we're taking all that, that rich uh, collection of data and then trying to see how can these pieces start to work together. Um, and then at the end, is sort of just fleshing out the final details of of actually what's going to happen on a given parcel. Um, and so we often talk about this as going from patterns to details, right? We're working from these, these dominant sort of constants in the landscape, right? And then from there, winnowing down to what our specific detailed plans are going to be. So if we're not paying attention to, we could say, climate, for example, um, or weather patterns that are predominant in your area, or the microclimates of your landscape, those things are we're probably going to continue to have climate. It's changing, obviously, but um, not paying attention to where or how much rainfall you get, for example, and plant, having a planting plan that's sort of agnostic to that information means that it's likely that you're going to have a, do a lot more work to manage that, right? Whether that's just through irrigation and so forth, and seeing as we, for the most part, when we're irrigating, are importing oil from across the planet, uh, using that to then run pumps and drag it up from somewhere deep in the earth, and then to hose it on our garden for some portion of the day, we could just simplify a whole lot of that by thinking a little bit more on the front end about what's, what's going to really grow well in this area with a little bit less management, right? So we're, we're striving towards reducing management and reducing the sort of labor required to keep these things going. I was also asked to sort of speak a little bit about sort of permaculture and sustainability. I often think of these sort of concepts as these carrots looming out in front of us, it's not that I woke up this morning and said, I'm going to have a sustainable day, but these are often things that are most um, accurately assessed in hindsight, right? So it's something that we can sort of backcast to say, all right, this, this process, this time, this period, this, this arrangement of resources and their use could maybe be termed sustainable. But it's very hard in the moment, in my perspective at least, to be able to say, oh, this is sustainable. Our, our permanent agriculture has led us to a permanent culture of some sort, right? So we're always kind of adapting, ever adapting towards that um, goal. Um, and this is a complex adaptive process. It's never static. And so we've got to make sure that as we are involving our implementation, that the plans that we set out have enough of an understanding or enough uh, sort of sway within them to ensure that the system itself can evolve. And that might be just in the form of multiple, even temporal plans that are produced for a given landscape so that you can already be having a sense of how the dynamic between the different species you're putting in there are uh, going to change over time. Um, so bringing this to the, to the home site, I think starting with uh, any analysis, one of the, the bits that I like to start with is just when and where are we? What is the natural history of the site? And what made this place? Right? What are, what's the 
the landscape and the resulting ecosystems are, are really formed by the interaction of the climate, of the landform, of, of the life that's on that land, right? And so if you're unaware of what those things are, your ability to work with them and to sort of embody some of that rich history into the design that you're working on is going to be limited. Um, and so obviously there's a great history here of beginning to you know, frame bioregional approaches from Moku down to Ahupua'a and Ili. So some of this is as easy as questions as, what moku do you live in? What does that tell you about that part of the island? Right? So Kona often tends to be a drier area. Ahupua'a often will have much, you know, rich information about the history of, of land use or of species or of some type of activity that happened in that area. And this is all information that we can use to inform our design work. Um, more broadly, I also like to think particularly in terms of these historical homes is that we're starting to weave these landscapes back together. Does anybody know what this photo is? Yeah? We don't know specifically, but yeah, it's Kipuka. So this is a Kipuka, right? It's uh, ever more apparent in some parts of the Big Island these days. Um, but thinking about how, you know, with, with this sort of natural history in mind, how, does our, how can our landscape function as a cultural kipuka in terms of our sort of keeping its historical heritage and nature, but also an ecological kipuka, right? So through our planting practices, through an understanding of the various species that were abundant or might may be abundant in other parts of your um, moku or ahupua'a, and sort of bringing back and having refuges for those species on your land um, can be another way to approach it. Interestingly enough, this is on uh, Reunion Island, not actually here in Hawaii. So another little bit that we like to look at as well is that while there is so much history to be had here that we can look at analog climates uh, around the world to see what other types of practices have been employed that we might be able to learn from here. Uh, all right, and so then bringing that all home is we're seeking sort of the synthesis between the built and ecological environments, and we're using the land, ideally striving towards mechanisms that are going to allow us to use the land to enhance the, our historic landscapes, and using the landscape to enhance the historic value of the property. Right? So it's this sort of reciprocal interaction. That's all um, very much in the clouds. You might be able to tell I'm a couple years into my PhD. There's a lot of theory. There's bigger words. So how does this ever touch ground? So I'm going to uh, give you a very expensive and complex approach, which is walk outside of your house, wander around, um, you might do some observation. Um, and so essentially just getting out, and this is the first way that I approach any sort of client interaction or any place, of, any, the pl best place to begin, right? And so the attempt to derive meaning from landscapes possesses overwhelming virtue. It keeps us constantly alert to the world around us, demanding that we pay attention not just to some of the things around us, but to all of them the whole visible world and all of its rich, glorious, messy, confusing, ugly, and beautiful complexity. And I love that quote. Uh, it's a fellow named Pierce Lewis, who, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, has a very fascinating uh, doc, uh, I guess I found it, it's like a, it's a book chapter called Common Landscapes as Historical Documents. Right, so this is really thinking about how does a landscape function as something that can be read to share the, to share the history of that place, and how do we get intentional about it. Um, and you can approach this in a lot of different ways. Right? It's observation. It can happen through various mechanisms, whether they're instrumental, experiential, thematic. Um, you can go out there with friends. Um, and, and one way to approach it, particularly in this context, would be if you look back on that page seven that, of Wendy's, was those landscape characteristics, right? We're talking about natural features, land use, vegetation, small features. Take those as sort of the subject headings on your notebook as you're wandering around and seeing who do you run into, what do they know about what happened in, in that area, what information can they share with you, and how can you start fleshing out the sort of corpus of knowledge that you can use to better interact and better design um, your landscape going forward. Another uh, permaculture designer, this fellow Sepp Holzer, is out of Austria, I like to refer to it as reading from the book of nature. Um, if this isn't enough of a formula for you, the guy uh, Pierce Lewis also wrote the axioms for reading the landscape, some guides to the American scene. That's a much longer paper. I will not bore you with it. Um, but uh, it's there if you'd like. Um, 
it also seems like another pretty fascinating way to go about it. But again, a little bit more on the academic than just the walk outside your front door. Um, in terms of design approaches, permaculture is unique in, has a couple of sort of design methods, I would say, that are unique to it. And one is this, this notion of zones of use, which we sort of construct as a gradient, or is often constructed as this sort of radial or orbital um, gradient of use, right? So we would say that our sort of areas of highest, um, highest use would be the, the home, right? So your home site itself is probably where you spend the most of your time. Um, and then from out from there, progressively, there's going to be spaces where there's less and less use, right? So there's usually some part of your yard that you have not seen in 15 years. I know I have one. Um, and then there's the parts every day that you traverse, right? And so you can begin to start figuring out, not just for yourself, but for whoever else uses, you know, you live with or uses that, that landscape. It's almost beginning to map out what are the circulation routes for that, and then where are the, the nexus points of those? And so if, as you're going to begin to thinking, think about implementing different um, tools like, or practices, right, whether that's a rain barrel or your solar system or your chicken coop or your kitchen garden, for example, if you're not aware or if you haven't put in the time to think about how much labor is it going to take, if my kitchen garden is in that, that area I haven't been to in 15 years just because it's, it is unused, are you going to really going to make the trip out there to use it too frequently? The chances are not. And so then, you know, with the best thing for a garden being a gardener's shadow, um, the likelihood is that that night might, might not be the most successful planting strategy. So we can sort of use this as a, as a way of overlaying how uh, a, a just a very simple, you know, bubble diagram, and not concentric, um, really, but more just you're mapping out where do I do what. Um, and we can overlay that with zones of preservation, right? So thinking, th and this is pulled from the document you had referenced. Um, and so we can have these two sort of overlapping gradients, right? So one is our zones of use and how intensively we use an area. And then another could be these zones of preservation. Or what are the parts of your land or parts of your home site that require you know, preservation versus rehabilitation versus restoration versus reconstruction? And so these two <coughs> excuse me, could conceivably then over, overlap to say, OK, well, here are the areas that I go relatively frequently, but that have a, maybe a lower sort of historical preservation value. So those are the ones where I might be able to do more of um, Something that, that's more about me or this time um, or the, you know, demonstrate the, the values and the ethics that are important to us as people today. Whereas the preservation areas or the areas you don't go as frequently are probably going to be less uh, engaged with. And so from that, you can begin essentially cobbling together uh, a, just a quick sense of how you can begin to design a, a landscape utilizing sort of these permacultural approaches, but also taking into account the historical value that you want to maintain. Um, so again, sort of where to begin. Read your landscape. Um, map your use and preservation needs. Um, and that allows you to begin to, to start sort of weaving together your story and history. Um, and so this allows us, ideally, to then begin telling uh, stories about what the values and priorities are of our time, right? So if we're talking about rain barrels and solar systems and so forth, right? There are, there are ethics that are in place now. There are, there are goals from, for society, for ourselves, that are a chapter in the, the tale of the landscape that you're a part of and are a way that, you know, through your conscious decisions about designing your land can share that part of the story. Uh, finally, a few resources. Um, the book that I nab those flow charts out of it. This is more focused really on like design um, heavy. Gaia's Garden is a great, uh, got more of the fancy gardening tricks. Um, Native Planters is, is always sort of my starting point for looking at um, entering some new part of the island or the state that has a great sort of historical uh, take on what was happening in a given moku, in a given ahupua for almost the entire state. Um, and what were the practices, what were the production, um, the crops that were engaged, or often other little tidbits. And so it's a great way, I find, to sort of start, start gaining a sense of place, I guess I'll say. Um, if anybody's interested in actual sort of design work, 
Uh, a friend of mine, Scott McCoy, has a company called Higher Ground Gardens, and he's been doing more sort of commercial permaculture design for folks for some time now. Uh, and then also in terms of just getting out there and getting your own hands dirty, this is the gardening Ponzi scheme I mentioned earlier, um, which is of late has been a partnership between the Surfrider Foundation and Permablitz Hawaii, which is essentially a reciprocal gardening network. You show up to help at three different work days, and then your name is added to the list of places that we come and do a big work day at your place. So it's really a Ponzi scheme for the organizers, not for the participants, because the more times we do it, the more people we have to go help in the future. Um, but they're a fun time, the food's pretty good, uh, and you tend to learn a lot and make some, possibly make some new friends. And just to sort of wrap this up, I'll, I'll close with a, a favorite quote of mine from Alexander Pope about the genius of place. So he's saying, consult the genius of the place and all that tells the waters or to rise or fall, or helps the ambitious hill, the heavens to scale, or scoops encircling theaters the veil, calls in the country, catches opening glades, joins willing woods and varies shades from shades, now breaks or now directs the intending lines, paints as you plant, and as you work, designs. Thanks.